Good morning, everybody. My name's Tom Holmes. I'm founding director of Varan Performance, the leading digital transformation consultancy. Um, as you all know, we're involved with multiple um, technologies. So we deliver um, ERP, back office, finance and HR and payroll for and with our clients working with Workday, with working with SAP and primarily, and today, focus on Oracle. And so I'm delighted to say that this morning I'm joined by uh, Phil Lupton, who has um, many years experience of delivering successful Oracle programs. And uh, what I really wanted to do today with Phil was to get his insights and knowledge as to how to deliver really successful Oracle programs. So Phil, good morning. Morning, Tom. How are you? Uh, very well, thanks. A bit hot, but very well. Can you give us a quick background on, uh, on why I say you're highly experienced in Oracle? Are you really? What have you done over the last 20 years or whatever? Actually, I was just sadly working out in my head. I think it's nearly 25 years now that I've been putting Oracle systems in. I've worked for very large uh, consultancies and uh, I've also run my own company um, and uh, more recently uh, joined Varan to start uh, working with Varan implementing Oracle. But um, I've done hundreds of implementations over the years. Um, yep. So, uh, and all Oracle, uh, most 99% of what I do is Oracle. Now, the reason that uh, we've got guys like uh, Phil as our team and leading our Oracle team in Varan is because Oracle programs are um, uh, not always as successful as a client wants them and, uh, and as we want to deliver them. They don't always run as smoothly as one would hope. And I really wanted to get insights from Phil today to understand better about what drives success in Oracle, what drives the outcomes which we know that technology can deliver and, uh, and, and what, what are the tips we need to pick up to achieve that in our programs. So I'd like to kick off a little bit with uh, Phil, why people are picking um, Oracle. So you and I spent a couple of hours with Oracle this morning, actually looking at their latest uh, developments, et cetera. So what, are you, what do you pick up? Why do clients pick Oracle? What's the thing which uh, they're looking for and what do they see in Oracle, which perhaps they don't see so much in other technology? Um. I think the main reason, so Oracle were very um, early to realize that uh, cloud was the, was the way forward and, and spent a lot of time and effort moving their entire platform, all their platforms to cloud um, over quite a few years. And, and their products are now quite mature. They're, the, the cloud applications has been around um, eight or nine years now. Um, so it's not a, it's no longer bleeding edge, um, but mostly they are really the only um, major organization that uh, of, uh, offer a complete end-to-end -end solution. So um, 15 years ago, everybody was talking about, you know, best of breed, you know, get, getting Bob to work across, uh, uh, putting in middleware um, to get all of the disk applications to work. But that just became a complete um, mess. And there's been many failed projects trying to get systems to talk to each other. And people spent more effort trying to get them to talk to each other than actually the benefit they got from going down the best of breed. And mm -hmm. Oracle is, when you look at the Gartner uh, quadrant, Oracle is pretty much the market leader in almost every area anyway. So to buy a, a complete end-to-end -end solution uh, just makes sense. And that's why most people are picking Oracle in my view. That's very interesting. I mean, my, my take on it is that, uh, you know, Oracle are unashamedly desirous of a, uh, a solution which is end-to-end, -end, which does everything for a client in the back office. And that, that is really interesting. So less reliance on third-party technology, ability to use Oracle for, for most business functions, which we've got, if not all of them, and an ambition to make, them, make it all of them in the back office. That's the first thing I see is different, that end-to-end -end capability and investment. The second part I see is their delivery to their ability to deliver against that promise. So Oracle's investment for the last five, eight years in, uh, in integrating various bits and pieces, moving to the cloud, rebuilding their technology so that it works in the cloud is, is, is all about backing up that end-to-end -end capability with delivery capability. So, but Phil, I'm kind of don't think that necessarily makes it easier or more certain in the actual implementation. 
So I, you know, we all hear about programs with Oracle and the other technologies, which take longer than we expect, don't deliver the results we expect, maybe don't achieve it. So I imagine you have come across programs which are more successful and those programs which have um, struggled longer to get their outcomes. What, in your view, drives successful Oracle programs? What do you need to do and how do you need to do that to achieve success with Oracle? Um, so I think almost any program that you put in um, uh, would follow this, should follow the same sort of path, regardless of, of the product. Although since Oracle has moved to cloud and you can't customize cloud, it's become much more visible. Um, so I've always taken the strategy that you shouldn't customize a solution. You should, uh, you should configure it and you should change your organization to work the way that the system wants to. But prior to moving to the cloud, organizations always had the choice not to. Um, but um, so I think that's driven some of the some 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 of the um, uh, of the projects to fail more. Um, but I don't think it's the product that fails. Uh, well, I know it's not the product that fails because we've got many many successful, happy Oracle Cloud users. So I do think there's 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 areas where organisations make specific mistakes, and I've sort of looked at it um, myself and sort of made some, uh, made some thoughts around it. And I think. And I'll touch on all the areas in detail, but I think the sort of five key areas where organizations make mistakes is, is one is around readiness. So they don't actually make sure they're, they're actually ready to start the project. And in fact, readiness to start the project should happen well before you've even selected the product. Um, the, um, they don't onboard the correct people. Um, they, they, um, they don't make sure the organization is in a position. I think the second one made though is they don't take change seriously. Um, 90% of what a good product does is it implements change. The system itself, if you gave me a complete list of your requirements, you know, every single requirement that you had and knew exactly what you wanted, should take about two or three weeks to implement Oracle Cloud. It's a configuration. So oh, I, don't want to, I don't want to hold you to that, Phil, but that sounds good. The, <laughs> so I carry on, that's but, the second point. But, it, but it's, it's the fact that they aren't ready for the, for, for the product and they don't really understand what they need. And I was going to move on to needs versus wants uh, shortly. So they don't, they don't take change seriously enough. They don't take ownership of the system early enough. So they sit there and they turn up to conference room pilots or P1s or model offices or whatever you call them as your organization. And they watch the, the system integrator walk through the system duly and demonstrate the system. But they don't start to take ownership of it until like the UAT, the testing phase, right at the end. I think that's a significant mistake um, that organizations make. They should be taking ownership of the system the day that Oracle sends in the URL to the pod. Um, they don't allow the organization and the product to mature during the lifetime of the product. So they think that the day the product starts is the day that Oracle sends you the URL and the day that it finishes is the day that you go live. That's just the middle part of the journey. But the last one, which is I think is often very significant, is, is a lack of sponsorship from the exec. So nobody likes change. Um, well, that's not true, I love change, but most people don't like change. The, um, most people do not see change is, is going to be good for them, and sometimes it isn't. Um, if you're at the moment, for example, if you're um, able just to phone up your local supplier, get the invoice, sign it off, and someone's going to pay it, and now someone's telling you you have to log on to a system and raise a requisition and get it approved, your life isn't necessarily improved. But it is, you know, but, um, so strong sponsorship from the execs is really important. They need to drive home the message right from day one that we are putting Oracle Cloud in, that we are going to change the organization to meet the cloud, and they need to understand that. Right, Phil, that is really useful. So I've picked up the five things here, and they're, they're so strong, I think we'll probably structure the rest of the conversation today around those. The first of those was readiness to start the project. The second was taking change seriously and, and actually focusing on it. The third was ownership of the system, driving that ownership early in the project and program. The fourth was acknowledging that the product is changing even during the program and then changes afterwards. And then finally sponsorship by the executive. So I'm really excited about those five things. Those sound like they sound absolutely right from my experience too. So if we start with the first of those, readiness to start the project so you know how do you 
do that, Phil? What do you bring to the table? How do you how do you support a client in being ready? And what do they need to be doing? What do we need to be doing to be ready? So the organization needs often starts by thinking, I need a new system. So they go out to market and they, they start talking to um, Oracle and uh, SAPs and all the other providers of the world and say, we want to understand how your system works. This is the this is where the first mistake happens. What they need to do as an organization is they need to sit back and look at what do they actually um, need. So they, in order to do that, they need, um, they need to identify key um, subject matter experts for all of their areas, and they need to work through the, um, and look at where they differ from a standard process, um, you know, a standard industry process. And they need to look at what they actually need and not what they want. Often the way organizations work is based on the way their current system forces them to work or historically how someone's always done it. So they need to look at what do they actually need? So they need to look at um, how, do, what, how do they contract with their customers? So how what do their customers actually need for them? What makes them special? You know, what's their IP in the market? That's very important. Um, a lot of the other stuff isn't, unless they are working under specific legislations, specific leg regulatory requirements, you know, they have to produce whole government accounts or, you know, the sort of plan cantable, the general accounting plan in, in France. These are absolute needs as an organization. And they need to also split their organization views into sort of operational, so front end operational and back end uh, uh, sort of finance, admin, HR. There is no reason I've ever met in all of the organizations I've ever worked at that they should process an AP invoice any differently, regardless of whether they are a large public sector organization or a small private or, or organization or any. So they need to focus on changing all of their processes in the back end to be standard. And they need to look at um, their operational systems and understand where they can standardize those to work with inside the system. And they should be doing this well before they've chosen a product, because actually this is a good thing for a business to do, even if they don't put a new product in. Right. And you've been um, part of uh, Varem's development of a, of a kind of phase zero for Oracle, phase zero being uh, Varem's term for preparatory activity, but a phase zero for Oracle to kind of encapsulate all those things, right? Yes. Um, so we have all of we have a lot of industry standard processes for, you know, for a large private sector, for a large public sector. Um, for, we have you know, processes. So that's exactly what we do. We engage with the customer and we walk through all of the standard processes, how Oracle works. And we look at where can we actually, where, where does the organization need to change? And we always drive this message. It's, it's very often the organization go, well, you know, we can't change. We can't do that. We have to do this. Our employees won't do this. Our suppliers won't do that. You know, um, none of which in my experience of having done this for many, many, many times um, is actually true. Um, so we look at where the organization can change, uh, needs to change. And because um, change needs to start before you put the system in, there's no point in starting putting a system in and then trying to figure out what it is you need to change. Because by that time, you've got a system integrator in front of you saying, right, so what do you actually want? Um, and um, what they actually end up doing is just building what you have today in the cloud, which, um, which, um, which is actually also even always possible. If you were one of the organizations I work with at the moment, they have hundreds of customizations. And in order to work in the cloud, they need to get rid of all those customizations because it's not optional to, um, right. to, 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 to keep them. So um, that's where we look at getting them ready because it sometimes takes a, a lot longer to change um, the, your behavior of your suppliers, the behavior of your employees, um, and sometimes the behavior of your customers than it does to put a system in. Well, I would equate this, I, I often equate this to kind of large infrastructure projects. When we talk about HR, finance, and, um, and uh, the, the rest of the back office, for many of us as kind of HR directors, finance directors, et cetera, this is the largest kind of infrastructure program we'll be doing um ever with it's our main investment to get things right and get that structure right and i kind of think about it in exactly the same way as those infrastructure projects you've got to think forward exactly what is this going to deliver what's the technical components what you know what technology are we going to use and select that and all that stuff but these things are not going into a vacuum 
when we've built that new infrastructure project, we need our customers to come to it. We need our different um, our staff to be comfortable with it. We need it all prepared. And the way they do it in successful infrastructure programs is by planning all of that up out before they start. And I feel that in the 20, last 25 years, we've spent a lot of time where people choose programs and other programs as a kind of adventure. I'm not quite sure where we're going to get to and what it's going to look like, but we're going to go through this journey. And I don't think that leads to, to the most successful programs. I think knowing exactly what the challenge is, exactly what it's going to deliver up front, you know, within certain parameters or details, of course, which you may um if you need to be refined during the program but the bare bones of exactly what it's going to be you're not going to succeed unless you've done those before you start the program is that is that kind of what phase zero does absolutely and um i often talk about roadmaps with my customers about you know the the um what the, is another roadmap um often people just think about it from a system point of view um but um and and that is also true you know roadmap will have you know, talk about drops of functionality and when you're going you know which phases you can, which services you're going to deliver and when but it also needs to talk about how the organization is going to change and when we're going to deliver those changes to the organization and we need to understand before you start a uh, so you start a project you need to actually have a complete uh, clear plan and roadmap of where you're going to go and when you're going to deliver stuff because i've had many projects not go live because despite them telling me that for 18 months that they are going to work with their suppliers to change the way their suppliers will work because they want to move to a self-billing model or you know whatever model they don't do it and it's because the um and and so the project doesn't go live because of it you know and that you know it will go live um but sometimes with a six seven month delay and that costs not only millions of pounds uh, you know significant amounts of money in delays mm. of the SI, but also the, the loss of opportunity to use the new systems and to operate more efficiently. So, um, you know, I completely agree. It's absolutely crucial that you at least at a, at a high level understand what, what, what your roadmap looks like and your plan is before you, before you embark, even choosing a product. Right. So you've talked about um, top tip one, which is that readiness and preparation to start the program. And actually, you just started touching upon your second point, which is taking change seriously enough. And I was thinking about that because change is often seen as a kind of soft thing. It's like, oh, these people have got to behave in a slightly different way, etc. But you just gave a very tangible example of change where suppliers on a, on a, they need to move and behave in a different way and presumably communicating and making sure that they're ready, et cetera, it's quite a big exercise. So during a programme, tell us about what taking change seriously really means, Phil. Um, yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And I'm sure everyone's worked on a project where you need to save some money so they immediately start cutting the change team and the training team and the communication team um, because they they consider that yeah they still need to build the system and that is um, a huge mistake many projects fail simply because people don't know what's coming so they, they haven't communicated they haven't communicated to their employees their customers and their um and their and their um and their suppliers you know so um, communication is absolutely key, as is, as is training. But when I was talking specifically about change, often change is 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 quite tangible in the um, in the fact that you need to issue new contracts either to you know, between yourself and your customer, your employees, or your suppliers. And sometimes it's a lot less tangible. It's around you know changing the the way that people approach things. You know, they they change uh, their mentality their their mentality and their thought processes about how they actually are going to how they're going to do their job and the journey that they're going to go through each day, you know, what their day looks like. And so I think broadly, that, this is, is this what we call culture change? Yes. I think kind of above it. Yeah, Sorry absolutely, absolutely, Tom. Cultural change, and I think the um, and I think people really underestimate the importance of that um, because often you go back to an organisation um, two, three years after they've gone live, and they've basically um, completely ignored the system. They know they've figured out how to extract the data into an Excel file and they, they are now filtering the data and just putting the answer back into the you know, Oracle system or whichever system they've chosen. And they haven't changed at all. And if you don't take the organization on the journey, 
And sometimes people, as I say, don't like change, so it, it is kicking and screaming. But sometimes you, if you don't take them on that journey, you will not see the benefits of the, of the new system. You just end up building a new system that works the same way your other system did. Something I've never understood is that when you look at the stats of programs which are less successful over more successful and then you know and do their post-implementation reviews and it's all published they always say that it was a lack of focus on the change required which was the a major factor in the program not going as well as they wanted to and yet it's still an area where it feels easier to reduce the activity, you know, do it ourselves, cut it out, you know, you use a couple of people to support change or something like that. And it's a weird thing, don't you think, Phil, when you're investing enormous amounts of uh, infrastructure investment, that all the research says it's about change, which leads to the success or less success amongst other things, but it's one of the key ones. And yet, actually, it's kind of hard to make that argument up front, right? Because Yes, uh, and um, as a person who comes from a build background, so I'm, a, I'm the sort of, I, it's very hard to keep me out of the system. It took me a long time as well to understand the importance of it, if I'm being honest about it, Tom. You know, I look at, well, my system works. It's, it's brilliant. You press the button. It's a, um, you know, it, it works exactly the way we described. Um, nobody really knows how to use it. Um, none of the organization is particularly invested into using it the way we've designed it. Um, and so you go back and, they, they think it's a terrible system and I, I never understood it took a long time to get to the point where I fully understood myself the importance of actually investing in change in not in changing the organization to, to actually work the way that you need it to work in training your staff properly uh, and there are tools you know Oracle has a good guided learning tool there are you know to help organization people learn but you absolutely have to invest in that and it is a cultural change and that comes from the top so um that that's one of the theories i'm sort of dipping into around you know lack of sponsorship is that the 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 exec have to not just be saying the right things they have to be doing the right things they have to be enforcing the message of change and they have to be um and they have to back you when you actually try to make those changes because as i say lots of people don't like change and not everyone sees change for the good so i um, i've made the same journey myself it's, you're exactly right. So I come from a technical background way in the distance and um, it's exactly the same. I used to think putting the tools out, making sure that they work and proving they work was the end of the job. And um, but I guess it's like putting a, you know, putting a beautiful workshop together with all the tools there. We know they all work, but that doesn't mean people are trained in their use and able to actually get the best out of that workshop to produce our clients products. I think I might have made a bit of a mess of the um, that that simile there, but <laughs> I think I think it's kind of um, it's clear what we mean. But it is very interesting that people from a technical background in our world are actually the largest promoters of that change activity and 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 that that business readiness side. So the third thing we said we've been through the preparatory stuff. Tip, tip one: we've talked about making change and taking it seriously, Phil. Your, your, your third one was actually about taking ownership of the system early. So what does that mean and how early do you promote this after these days? So we, um, we look at getting the ownership of the system almost from the day one. So obviously when Oracle give us a pod, we need to configure the pod so it works. Um, and you know, that's based on you know, standard best practices and understanding what, how the business will work. But Typically, where I've worked with many SIs, and I have worked with an awful lot of the or most of the main SIs of Oracle in the UK over the years, um, they they all basically slip into the same mistake. Where what they do is they turn up to a workshop and they stand at the front and they demonstrate a out of the box you know process very well. Um, customer nods and 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 you know makes some comments, and then they go away, and then the customer doesn't think about the system or barely thinks about the system until the next round of, of, of workshops. So what we, we, we completely move away from that. The system is a configurable system. Mm. It, you can't really break it. Um, you know, even if it's badly configured, it's really hard to break. Um, 
the um, Oracle will probably be very pleased to say that it's almost unbreakable. It's, um, so we take a diff very different approach. We configure the system based on what they say, and then we ask the customer to come along and operate the system. So come in and actually use the system you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it has many benefits of doing, of operating the system from day one is it, it starts to really drive home whether or not uh, the processes are, are going to work and but, um, for that organization. And it gets, gets the, the user into, into the mindset that they actually, of how the processes are work and they start to think about how that would work for their system. It gets them to you know, start to learn the system. So they have, there is a much slower learning curve later on, but it also means that they start to get ownership of the system because in later phases of the sort of operate mode, we get them the business to then start showing other parts of the business of how it operates. And it's, you know, th th by that time, they can often be quite proud of the system, you know, and they'll start to demonstrate it um, to other parts of the business and start to evangelize about it. Right. So this is a kind of, you know, back in the day, we had CRP1 and CRP2 and stuff like that. And the concept of doing this was really kind of there. But you go into those CRPs and it would be such basic configuration, so far away from my actual working life that engaging with it was, was quite tough, I think, for clients. So you're describing a process where you're bringing that right forward so that it's, you know, it's almost uh, like a full UAT or model office at a very early stage of the programme. Yeah, I mean, we... It, it... I don't think that a, a configurated system works brilliantly with sprint, but it is more of a sprint methodology rather than just a show and tell. Um, it is more of a let's walk through the processes with you as an organization and get them to own the processes. Because nowadays, getting data into the system is much easier than it used to be. Um, getting into getting third party systems to integrate to your system, you know, most of them, as it's an Oracle cloud system, or have pre built integrators or accelerators. So. So getting a, a, a system that is, is sort of 85, 90% of a production system very quickly is actually not as difficult as organizations think it is. The, the bit that takes more time is reporting, um, but the more data you load, the easier it is to understand reporting. But, the, but getting them to operate the system very early has many benefits. Um, and mostly that one of the biggest benefits is it has around ownership. Because typically, as you mentioned, CRPs is that organizations turn up and they pay Lots of people take lip service to CRP and they go, it doesn't matter. When we get to UAT, we'll figure it out then. And right, right, right. everybody has had it where they come up and go, oh, yeah, but I didn't tell you about this company over here. You know, and, they, you know, whereas if you do it this way, you don't need a testing phase. So therefore, you take the testing phase away and people don't have that opportunity. They know that from day one, they have to bring the system to you. They have to start to own it and they have to start to operate it. Because once you get through sort of the end of an operate resolve uh, phase of a project, you go live. And that's all part of maturing the product into, into live. As, you know, the system naturally gets to the point where it's ready to go live and we just move it into production. Love it. So that ownership, that really, uh, that ownership of the system early is really key to successful Oracle programs. I guess, you know, this brings us almost onto your fourth point, which is that it's not like the old world. We used, I used, we used to configure, build Oracle systems, get everyone changed and all that, and then put them live. Then we could all breathe a sigh of relief because we've got 10 years living with the same solution. But, uh, you know, you've got a changing target. So how do you deal with the quarterly releases, the constant changing of the solution, which I guess in part during the program, but also after the program. So how does, how do you gain ownership in that world, Phil? Yes, well, Oracle has forced us a little bit to do some of this, but um, <laughs> I've always considered that go live is the start of the journey, not the end of it. Um, it's maybe not, that's maybe a slight exaggeration, but organizations need to mature into a, into a product. They need to learn how a product actually works. And sometimes it isn't right to switch all of the functionality on in day one. And, and often a system the size of Oracle will often have lots of other functionality that will come up um, later that you want to do, you want to use. But Oracle also forces you every three months to evaluate everything you actually have because they release um, mandatory patch upgrades. Um, some yes. of the, most, most of the new functionality you can choose to switch on or not, but that's not true in all cases. And Oracle probably hate me for saying that. If they change like they did with, um, recently with the HR made it a responsive UI so they completely changed the look and feel that was an it did take a while before Oracle made it mandatory but it is a mandatory change 
So all of the managed self-service screens changed massively for the better. They're much better in the, new, in, the new, in the new process, but that was a change that had to happen for many organizations well after the day that they've gone live with the system. And presumably, Phil, you analyze what's coming up and then identify it, work out where the impacts are so that the client, the client and the customer can, you, you can help them navigate what the new stuff is. Is that yep. why we had to spend two hours with Oracle this morning looking at their new stuff? Yes, <laughs> their, 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 um, customer, their user journeys uh, that they're bringing, exactly right. Where we spend some time with Oracle understanding, because Oracle had the same frustration. If they, they spend all this time and effort really building all this great new functionality, and then if nobody actually uses it, it's a waste of time. So, um, so yes, it was really useful to spend some time with Oracle today and look at how the um, how their new functionality would, would could be used, and you know, and and look at how it would work. Um, so, yes, it was. Um, but they also issue readiness notes every six, you know, six weeks before the before the release date, and we spend a lot of time going through them. And sometimes, uh, including very recently. Uh, Quite dull, but a new API they've brought into 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 the system has has been hugely helpful for one of my customers because the you was unable to interface that data directly into the system. Yeah, so sometimes it can be a new piece of functionality, sometimes it can be a new web service, but um, but that actually gives you the opportunity to improve your system and look at how you're operating every three months, and that's really important that organisations understand that that the journey doesn't stop the day you turn the keys. So. That brings us on. That was really useful. I, I understand that. So by getting that, driving that ownership and then pre-warning and doing that technical analysis of what's coming up, you're able to make it manageable that things are improving, which, of course, is a benefit, right? No more upgrades. In the end, it's good, but it's a bit painful at the time. Uh, that brings us to your final tip, sponsorship of the exec. And I'm kind of feeling, it's surely if I got the last four things right, then, and then I'm going to have a successful Oracle program. Why is why do you need sponsorship? Is that what's why does that matter so much to the success of what is after all a back office system? Phil? So, um, well, not all of Oracle systems are back office. Some of them are quite operational. But um, I stand corrected. Yes. You know, the, the, um, <laughs> but why is it important? Because actually, um, people won't necessarily change. People won't necessarily take ownership of the system um, if the exec do not sometimes force people to. So it's very easy to actually to say, yes, we're going to change to cloud. And right up until the point where somebody who's been with the organization for 30 years and is valued says, I can't change. I don't want to change. Um, at that point in time, um, the exec absolutely needs to, to drive that message home around around this. Because as soon as they don't, and I've seen this so many times over, over my career, um, as soon as they don't, and you allow one one thing to slip through the net, you know, one thing that isn't, you know, it, it's the sort of, it, it opens the floodgates. And um, the, 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 so the exec need to be very clear. They need to understand that they will upset some people inside their organization by putting this change in because some people are very invested in the way they work today, systems they use today. Um, and it is really important that they understand that and that they are very open to this. And that sometimes um, the um, the uh, the change won't be perceived as a good change, and they'll have lots of people coming and to them and complaining about it. So it is very important that they understand that and that they buy into that completely, and that they don't just they don't just say it. But as soon as someone complains, they change their mind. So um, it's the only way of getting the other stuff to happen. Yeah, yeah, that's very useful. So it's actually you know they're not needed all the time, but they're really needed when you and the team see that some of the client management some of the customer team aren't adhering to the principles of the programs etc and that's when you really need your sponsors in there very good very good so phil thank you very much this morning that was incredibly useful on your tips and your experience of how to uh, drive success in an oracle program um, i'd like to just quickly uh, run through the five things for everyone who's listening which are Firstly, preparing and getting readiness for the project right before you actually start that program. Taking change seriously and making it central to the program. Supporting your business, our business, in taking ownership of the system and the new processes actually right at the beginning of the program, not as we're all tempted to do right at the end. And then 
understanding and embracing the fact that the product's going to change over time. So growing with the product and, and, and creating a program which is responsive to that. And finally, sponsorship of the executive. So I hope that was useful to everyone uh, who joined you. Thank you very much for your uh, time this morning. Thank you again, Phil, for joining us. It's great to talk to people who really have done these programs again and again so that we can learn from those. And um, everyone have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom.